Are you a weaver or want to be one? Welcome to Weaver of Tales podcast, where we explore the extremes of human imagination. Our story for today is inspired by Jenny Mae Rolian, who was gone too soon and too young. Wherever you are, just know that as long as this story lives, we will always remember you. Purple, black, and blue. Abused people, abuse people. This phrase is on repeat in my mind while I smoke my cigarette. I'm 17 years old, a junior high school, and should not be doing this. My mom reminds me every waking moment of my life that smoking is bad for my health and should stop this nonsense. That's her exact words. If she only knew. Not only am I doing cigarettes, but I also do weed. Teachers say that I'm rebellious, but they're wrong. I turn to my vices, not for fun, but to forget. A laugh threatened to bubble in my chest when he tripped and almost face-dived on the cobblestones. Good news or bad? I asked watching him caught himself before the disaster. His lies lit up. So I knew instantly that he's bearing pleasant news. He started his rumbling explanation. Out with it, Jer. He stopped mumbling, composed himself, and uttered, You should see her. He smiled, showing off his set of uneven, yellowish teeth. I always wonder if this guy's ever known what a toothbrush is. Pretty or a so-so? I cocked my eyebrow, took one last puff of my cigarette, and threw it under my feet. I started walking with him on my heels. Pretty is a lame adjective to describe her. Don't go genius on me now. Well, she's pretty and hot, so I'll describe her as pretty hot. Does that make sense? His face wrinkled and I laughed. Don't do that to your face, you look like a prune. He laughed in a pretty laugh and continued. Do you want to hear another good one? Hit me, I said, waiting for him to continue. She's in our class. Jerry tends to exaggerate things all the time. So I was baffled when I took a good look at the girl as she entered the room. Long, straight black hair. Almond-shaped eyes, creamy white skin, tall and slender figure. She's not just pretty hot. She's a goddess. My eyes never left her from the moment she walked in the door. She showed our professor her schedule and was asked to introduce herself to everyone. Standing in front of the teacher's desk, she clamped her hands and said her name in a soft voice. What did she say her name was? Was it Maine? I'm not sure, so I asked aloud, cutting off her introduction. What did you say your name was? Maine? She looked at me with her almond brown eyes. Not waiting for her to answer, I added, Or can I call you mine? The whole room I laughed and the boys hooted. I enjoyed watching her squirm under my gaze, cheeks now tinted with red. Cut it off, children, a professor intervened. Hunter, that's not a very good display of behavior, she said, looking at me with distaste. Miss Ibanez, please take your seat. Eyes cast down, she walked slowly to the only chair available. She hesitated at first, but knowing that she had no choice, she sat down on the chair beside me. I gazed at her, but she never did the same. No, Dad! Stop it! Stop! My little legs ran to my mom, who's now crumpled on the floor unconscious. 
I put my small arms around her, hoping to protect her from my father. He's standing on his feet, eyes bloodshot, and his words slurred. Not only was he drunk, but also high on drugs. I knew this because this is what's constant in my life. Yeah, protect your whore of a mother, you little twat, he spat. You're as useless as she is. I think you're not even my son. I shook my head, tears streaming down my face. That's not true, I shouted. His face turned dark. And you have the nerve to shout at me? Do you know who I am? I am the one feeding you and that bitch, he shouted, pointing to my mother. I hugged her unconscious body tighter. If it's not for me, you too will be on the streets begging for money and eating scraps from the garbage can. A squeak came out of my mouth when he grabbed me roughly by my shoulders and shook me so hard I thought my neck is going to break. You two are ungratefully useless people. I have sacrificed a lot of things for nothing and now I'm miserable. Without preamble, he put me down unceremoniously that my butt hurts. Remember this, his hand clamped on my cheeks with force. I can feel the insides of my cheek stuck to my teeth. You, he emphasized, do not talk back to me. Do you understand? Fresh, hot tears sprung from my eyes as the pain became unbearable. Do you understand? He yelled again. I nodded my head slowly. Good. Finally. He released me and my gaze followed his retreating figure to the top of the stairs until he disappeared inside the bedroom. I felt something trickle down my chin. My hand reached the front of my shirt and wiped it. Under the dim lights, I watched that spot on my shirt turn from white to red. Blood. Then my eyes fell to my mother's face, which is now colored with purple, black, and blue. Someone is screaming. I tossed and turned trying to look for who it was and my effort seemed futile. Now the screaming turned to sobbing. I can feel my chest tighten and the wetness on my cheeks woke me up. Trailing my fingers on my cheeks, I realized that the sound of screaming and sobbing came from me. My eyes scanned the darkened room and nothing seemed out of place. I took several deep breaths, willing my mind to concentrate on the low hum of the air conditioner. The green glow of my digital clock on the bedside table caught my attention. 1 AM I just slept for two hours. This nightmare rarely came, but when it did, it never faltered to elude me of sleep afterward. Knowing that there's no more sleep for me for tonight, I got out of my bed and prepared to run. At times like these, one of my consolations to run and tomorrow, weed. The moon is high up its zenith, bathing everything with its mystical glow. I filled my lungs with an ample amount of air and reveled at the sweet burn of exertion. I studied the surroundings, and by the looks of it, I'm on the part of town where the housing project for the low and average income families was built by my stepdad three years ago. I snorted as I remembered him. He's not bad, it's just that I have issues with authority figures especially when he's the mayor and expects me to be on my proper behavior all the time, which I'm not. Though, I should give it to my mom. After marrying a loser, which is my dad, she got it big this time. My stepdad is a good catch. He came from a rich and powerful family with acres of land and lots of businesses, which made him an unbeatable candidate when he decided to run as a mayor. I don't like him that much, but whenever I see how he looks at my mom with love in his eyes, I almost want to like him. 
A bang of the door as it opened and closed woke me up from my reverie. I skidded to a stop and watched as the girl stepped out of the front door and just sat down on the lawn outside their house. I let my eyes linger on her form. Wearing a white nightgown and a white robe, dark hair played by the wind, she looked like an apparition. I froze when she put her hands on her face and started crying. In my haste, I tripped on a stone and sent it skidding off on the concrete road. The girl's head snapped to where I was standing and my heart started to beat frantically. Tear stain and hair in disarray, Maine still looks as dashing as she was earlier today. I wanted to go to her and console her, but the coward in me got the best of me. I ran off and justified my cowardly exit with one thought in my mind. Everyone has a problem, and I don't need to know them. My days passed in a blur. All that I could remember were the times that my friends and I spent at the back of the building smoking cigarettes and weed. This week is pretty uneventful. After the night I saw Maine crying, I never talked to her and she did the same. We just kept to ourselves even though we sat together for almost all of the subjects. I hit on her outside class especially when she walks down the corridor and we're there. She doesn't have any friends either. Maybe because she's aloof and doesn't talk much or that other girls' insecurities stop them to befriend her. I wanted to talk to her and know her, but I just don't want her to be tangled up with all the shitty things I do. She's perfect, and I'm just me. Besides, I'm no Prince Charming who can sweep off her feet and save her from all her problems. I've got problems of my own that needed fixing. My nightmares visited me every night now, and it's not a good thing because every time it happens, my hands always get to weed to escape. Another on my plate was the fact that our teacher caught us doing it and gave us detention for a month of clearing and cleaning the back of the building, the same spot where she found us, and turned it into a garden. Plus, a summon letter was sent to my stepdad and mom informing them of my whereabouts. A response, they grounded me but that didn't stop me from sneaking out in the middle of the night to do my thing with the gang. It was one of these occasions when Rick brought something up. Do you guys have any idea who rat us out? I asked. I looked around as they exchanged knowing look with each other. Silence. Then one of the boys said, It's surprising that you have no idea who it was. I shrugged. I've been distracted. Someone laughed. Distracted with Maine? Then everybody laughed. I shook my head, but it seemed like they're on this together and would not let me deny it. Bro, you look at her like she's food or something. John sneered and added, Well, she must taste good. He licked his lips with his tongue and smirked. At that moment, I wanted to defend her from my friend's remarks and slap John's face. Instead, I heard myself say, One of these days, I'll have a taste. The boys hooted and guffawed. All the best for the king, one shouted, and I just smiled. So tell me, who rat us the hell out? My question brought silence to the place. Rick cleared his throat and said, It was Jerry. We cornered Jerry in a classroom one evening. He's a part of the student government and thus, with the upcoming JS prom, was so busy one night that he forgot the lingering threat that I gave him days ago. We walked on him hammering a stand for the backdrop. He didn't seem to hear or see us, maybe because of the loud song he's playing. Hitting one of his fingers, I watched him curse, drop the hammer, and looked up. The blood drained from his face as he saw eight of us standing by the door. Hunter? He smiled but seemed to be a grimace to me. Hey, Jer. I see you're busy, I smiled. 
Yeah, the JS prom will be next week, so there's a lot to do. He stood up. I can see the anxiety on his face. What brought you here? He stammered. I don't want to waste my time and yours, Jerry. You see, brothers have a code of honor and there are consequences when you breach it. I know that, Hunter, but I was forced to choose between my code of honor with you and my future. He bit his lip. I'm so sorry. I clenched my jaw. He just said the wrong words at the wrong time. I just nodded at him and said, Well, it's now time for us to make it even, don't you think? With a flick of my fingers, the boy started beating and kicking Jerry while I watched. The hammer he's holding earlier lay useless on the floor. I picked it up as I watched blood spatter everywhere. I hate myself right now, but the urge to hurt someone who I thought hurt me is very strong. Minutes passed and Jerry stopped the mewling sounds he was making. Rick and John held him up and brought it to me. Want to finish him up? asked John. I gripped the hammer on my right hand to give the final blow, but when I saw his face, I froze. Purple, black, and blue colored his busted face. No, let's just leave him here. He has no use to us dead. Let him be a warning to others. He might rot us out again, John protested. I shook my head. No, he's not. We just reminded him about our code of honor and he knew better than to break it again. I said looking at Jerry's half-closed eye. Isn't that right? He nodded. Good. Let's go. Without looking back, we walked out of the room and left him lying on the floor with BTS's song Idol on the background. Word got out fast after that night. Jerry has been hospitalized and was back after three days. His parents wanted to call for the police to investigate, but he was adamant that there's no need to do so and that he didn't know his perpetrators. He emphasized that it was a theft that turned bad because he tried to fight them off. His parents, who didn't know much about their son's whereabouts, just let it slide, but the school had a different story in mind. Though they never dared to pin it on me because they have no evidence and Jerry won't cooperate. Two days before the prom, the school is in a buzz. All the boys were busy wooing the girls they wanted to date. Some desperate girls did the same. I was asked by a lot of girls, both juniors and seniors, to be their date but I declined. I only wanted one girl to be with on the event and lucky for me, one of the senior guys already asked her out and she said yes. I was enraged when I heard about it and planned to ambush him the way we did with Jerry. But I changed my mind. Unlike Jerry, he will for sure tell the police who did it. And the last thing I want this time is trouble. As I looked at Maine sitting beside me taking down notes, I promised myself one thing. I'll get her by hook or by crook. The event unfolded with a blast. With a black and gold theme, the gymnasium turned into an elegant Greek-like place with Greek-like looking students who wore the same colors. This is the only event in school that alcoholic beverages are allowed to be served to us, so I took a flute of champagne offered by a waiter and looked around. The dance has started and people are sweet dancing on a slow song holding each other like lovers. My eyes stopped on a girl wearing a high-necked, long-sleeved black gown. Her hair is done in an intricate updo manner with pearl clips holding them. I admired how her face looked so natural compared to those other girls who made makeup a lifesaver. She has this natural dewy look going on that she surely rocked. I can feel my feast close as I saw how Cedric is holding her so close. Before I knew what I'm doing, my feet started walking towards them. With the help of weed that I took before the event, 
I asked with confidence, looking only at Min. Can I have a dance with this beauty? I saw him shook his head at the corner of my eye before he replied. It depends on Min if she wants to. I saw Min's beautiful smiling face turn to one of surprise and then disgust. Why is she disgusted? Am I that horrible for her to feel that way? My heart sank when she shook her head too. I clenched my jaw as I hold on to the last verge of my control. Well, it seems like the girl didn't want to dance with you. A taunting smile lit up Cedric's face. I clenched and unclenched my hands and then smiled. Suit yourself. I looked at Maine with a promise. Get off me, Hunter! Main shouted as I pinned her body on the wall and tried to kiss her. I deflected every blow she made with ease. This is one of the advantages of being on weed. You feel so strong and your inhibitions disappear. She tried to shout but my hand clamped on her mouth and the other ripped her dress off. The buttons of her long sleeve dress gave out and her skin was exposed. My eyes wandered to her creamy white skin which is tinted with... I froze. Purple, black, and blue. I heard Main crying. I let go of her as if her skin burned me. I was standing, looking at her with my mouth hanging open. She covered her exposed chest with her hands and spat. Now you see, Hunter, I'm not that beautiful at all. This is what I'm hiding and this is the reason that I put a space between you and me. One look at you and I know that you're just like him. I was startled with the revelation. It took some minutes before I found my voice and said, What do you mean? Who am I reminding you of? It's none of your business, she shouted. Even though tears trailed down her eyes, smudging the mascara she wore, she still looks pretty to me. Her lips quivered as sobs still racked her body. Unable to think of what to do, I ran my fingers on my hair and licked my lips. My throat felt so dry and my tongue felt like sandpaper. My heart pumped so hard that my chest hurts. I'm so sorry, I didn't know. Just leave me. Leave me alone. I shook my head and took a step towards her. No, just don't go near me. She croaked toward ending me off with her hands. That didn't stop me from pulling her into my arms and hugging her. She struggled, tried to push me back, but gave in when I hugged her into me tighter. She sobbed and I rocked her as if in dance until there are only the sounds of our breathing and heart beating surrounded this dark, secluded area. I'm so sorry, May. I don't know. Who did this to you? She just shook her head and snuggled in my chest. That night, I took her home and lent her my coat for her to wear over her ruined dress. I opened the passenger's door of my car and helped her out as I parked in front of their house. We didn't say a word throughout our drive home, and I'm just happy watching her drift off to sleep in my passenger seat. I watched her open the gate and lock it back. She smiled a small smile and gave me a little wave which I returned. The small gesture made my heart flutter. Before her foot touched the first stair of the porch, a man went out of the door and yelled at her. I can feel my frown forming on my forehead and my body is on high alert. I looked at the man's face, memorizing every detail of it and felt the hate I felt for my father crept back in my heart for this man. When Maine is safely inside, the man looked at me hard. We're on a staring contest which was broken only when a woman who seems to be Maine's mother called for him. Giving me a last hard stare, he walked back in. At that moment, I knew in my gut that I hate this guy 
and May needs my protection just like my mom needed mine. Months passed and a lot had happened. Main and I shared our story starting with the abuse my mom and I suffered from my father. She also shared the ones she endured with her stepfather. We cried together when she hesitantly told me about how he raped her when she turned 12 and her mother's denial through it all. We looked at each other and saw the broken persons inside each of us which formed a connection between us. I started avoiding my gang and thus avoiding weed altogether. I still smoke sometimes, but not as often as I did. We grew closer together and before we knew it, we fell in love. Everyone saw the change in me and with it, I received mixed reactions. My mother and stepdad were happy with it while my gang called me weak and never spoke to me again. I asked Jerry for forgiveness and I was surprised when he accepted it so easily. We started hanging out again. The teachers also saw the change but never commented on it. Maybe they knew better than to believe the change they're seeing so easily. I don't care about what other people are saying, all I know is that I want to change for the better. Relationships are not always perfect. Main and I fought with a lot of things, especially when the topic falls back to the abuse she is receiving from her stepdad. One day, I almost dragged her to the police station when she sported a new bruise on her arm. She said that she just tripped, but I knew better because I heard this line too many times from my own mom's mouth. She cried pleading me not to tell anyone. She said that she loves her mom so much and she doesn't want to meddle with her happiness. I was so frustrated and angered with her reasoning that I felt like I was to combust. But I heard her out and advised her to call me when she thinks her stepdad is about to blow up again. And she agreed. I also remind her to lock her door when she sleeps, which she followed. There are moments in our life that we tend to remember the most, and for me, that is the day before her 18th birthday. Since no one celebrates birthdays in her family, I asked my mom and stepdad to have her celebrated in our home. Knowing Maine, I instructed my parents that it should be simple and not extravagant, which they happily complied with. After a small dinner, my parents retired to their rooms, leaving us huddled together on the sofa. Happy birthday in advance, mine. A small smile crept on my lips. She chuckled at the endearment. It stuck to us both, so we decided that it's a good one and used it. I'll be 18 in two hours, she replied. Tomorrow I can start packing my things up, find a job, and leave on my own, she added enthusiasm evident on her face and voice. I snorted. You know that you don't need to find a job, right? I can ask my dad to grant you a scholarship. Besides, I know that you will qualify. She shook her head adamantly. That's unfair with those other students who got it the proper way. Well, we can do it the proper way if you like. I'll just do it next year when the scholarship application opens. That's when we do it properly, okay? I just nodded and put my arms around her shoulders. What about your parents? Do they have an idea about what you're planning? She nuzzled to my chest and shook her head. They won't let me if they knew. But then, I'm 18 when the clock struck 12 and they can't stop me from leaving. I'm always worried whenever you're at home. I mean, I'm afraid about what your stepdad's going to do with you. She laughed. I'm braver now, and that's because of you. Well, thanks to me. She laughed again. I held her hand, a thought toyed in my mind. When the classes start this year, I remember one of the professors said that 
abused people abuse people and I realized that the reason I was acting out and abused people around me was that I was a victim of abuse myself. Yes, I think it's a pattern, she replied, her fingers playing with mine. I beg to disagree. Look at you. You've been abused, but instead of acting out like me, you're doing the opposite. She was lost in thought for a moment before saying, Maybe because every person has a different reaction to things? I mean, unlike you, I just put people in a distance for them not to hurt me. I agreed. You have made a very good job of doing that until I came into the picture. And that comment was rewarded with a punch in my stomach. We laughed together and then she said seriously, Forgiveness? I think that's the only way to stop the cycle of abuse. I think it's only you who can do that, I teased. She disagreed. Everyone can do that, Hunter, and you should learn how to forgive. You see, hating those people who hurt us can turn us just like them. This is the reason why abuse is a cycle. A dad who abused his son will turn his son into an abuser too. This son will may have a son, and he might abuse him as well. If the son doesn't have the heart to forgive his father, I added, resigned to the thought that she's right. Yes, she agreed. Well, I just want you to know, I love you so much, she said. I was startled. This is the first time that she said those words to me. Oftentimes, it's me who says them. I love you too, Maine. Then we kissed. Hi, this is Regine, and you know how I love listening to podcasts. I've been binging on podcasts for a year when a thought came to mind. Why don't I make my podcast and tell my stories? I thought it's tough to make one until I found out about Anchor. Podcasting with Anchor is easy as one, two, three. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Plus, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. The best part is, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. So what are you waiting for? Download the free Anchor app now or go to anchor.fm to get started. Blue and red. These are the colors swirling around Maine's house when we arrived. Dread crept in my body like a tick on its spray as I watched four men bring out a black body bag. I can tear my eyes off it. I have a sense of foreboding that I will not like what I will see when that bag is opened. Nothing came out of me. No tears flowed down my eyes. No words formed in my mouth. All I saw before everything went black was my stepfather's ashen face and my mother's tear-stricken cheeks. I can feel the raindrops trickle down my body, soaking my clothes and felt the slap of the cold wind. But I still refuse to move. It's dark now, and as my eyes wandered around the cemetery, all I can see are the white cross stones where the name, date of birth, and date of death of the people laying here were engraved. My eyes stopped to the one in front of me and I touched it. Main. Hot new tears escaped from my eyes, and knowing that the rain will wash them out, never bothered to wipe them. I thought four months is enough time for me to recover, but I was wrong. 
that same big hole bore into my chest making me feel empty inside. I almost went back to my vices just to alleviate the pain, but every time I attempted to do so, Main's face and words stopped me. Forgiveness? I think that's the only way to stop the cycle of abuse. Forgiveness and not vices will make me better. I told myself this every day of my life, but how can I forgive when the pain is still so fresh? How can I forgive other people when I can't even forgive myself? Then my mother's words from last night came to my mind. It's not your fault, Hunter. If Maine is here, she would say that you need to forgive yourself. There's no need for you to beat yourself up for something that you didn't even do. Looking at Maine's epitaph, I asked, Should I start forgiving myself, mine? Should I forgive those people who hurt me and do? If an answer, a flash of lightning struck the atmosphere, giving light to my surroundings. And that's when my eyes caught a white flower blooming beside her tombstone. White means peace. And to have peace, I should learn how to forgive. It's not easy, but it's possible. I lay down beside me, ignoring the pouring rain on my body and imagined her creamy white skin, this time without a tinge of purple, black, and blue. Smiling for the first time in 120 days, I made a promise to myself and her. Today, I'm forgiving myself, and tomorrow, I'll forgive them too. Drug abuse and abuse against women and children resonate with me. I feel so deeply about these topics because it's so heartbreaking to see lives getting wasted and taken prematurely just like what happened to Jenny. I don't know her personally but through my mom who was her elementary teacher, I get to listen to her tale. This might not be a story about her but this is inspired by her. I can still remember how I felt when my brother and mother told me what happened. I felt devastated but never showed it. I only had the chance to cry when I was in bed beside my baby girl, thinking of what Jenny's mom might have felt and those who loved her. Watching my daughter sleep, a sense of protectiveness rose inside of me. This inspired me to weave this tale not just for the sake of entertainment but to have my voice and message be heard. Just like what Sina said, I always channel my emotions into my work. That way, I don't hurt anyone but myself. If you're against drugs and abuse of women and children too, then spread this message to anyone. Let's be proactive in doing what is right. This time, we never turn a blind eye to a person who's starting to get addicted to drugs, to a child we see being maltreated, and to a woman who got abused. And if this is you, don't be afraid to speak up and find help. As for the children who cannot speak up, let us use our voice as their voice. As Alex L. said, You are not a victim for sharing your story. You are a survivor setting the world on fire with your truth. And you never know who needs your light, your warmth, and raging courage. If you have a story to tell or wants your message to be broadcasted to the world, Please feel free to email your stories to Weaver of Tales Podcast at gmail.com or visit our FB page that's Weaver of Tales Podcast where you can post it to our wall. Until next time, good night. Mm-hmm.